Welcome everyone from the fall 2024 SUS classes, friends of the college, colleagues, and the family of Meinhard Dewell, and to all of those joining us online this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Dalhousie is situated, and those of us here this evening are gathered in Shibuktuk, within the traditional and unceded territories of the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq, Wolastawak, and Wabanaki Confederacy. I'd also like to acknowledge the contributions and legacies of the African Nova Scotian communities who have shared these lands for over 400 years. And I'd like to turn things over to Sarah Harding, the Dean of the Schulich Law School. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, again from me. Um, so this uh, lecture, this is the second year. Last year, I was actually not able to be here. And Sarah Sack, in the law school, you can only have the name Sarah. There's three of us sitting here tonight together. Um, Sarah Sack read a message from me um, to the um, uh, crowd gathered um, on that first annual lecture. So, um, so this year I'm here, um, and it's really a delight for me to be here. But I want to share some of the same sentiments um, that I shared last year. Um, so as a brand new member of the faculty at the Schulich School of Law in the fall of 2023, I did not have the benefit of knowing Meinhardt as a colleague, um, which made me very sad because everything I had heard and learned about him um, made it clear that he was a fantastic colleague in every way possible. But I did know him as a law student. Meinhardt was in my class uh, and we graduated together in 1989. Everything I remember about him from that time, his warmth, his smiling, his smile, his unfailing intellect, and his commitment to concerns about our environment made him deeply loved and deeply respected at the law school then, as he is now still today. His contributions to the school, the community, and I think we can even say the planet are inspirational. I'm glad we will have this annual reminder uh, every year through the Meinhardt Doyle Lecture Series, this annual reminder of his many enduring contributions to Dalhousie, this faculty, and the field of environmental law. And heaps of thanks to the members of the Marine and Environmental Law Program for helping, get to get, helping put together this program uh, now for its second year running. So thank you and welcome. So thank, thank you, um, Dean Sarah Harding. Uh, my name is also Sarah. I'm Sarah Suck, and I'm the director of the Marine Environmental Law Institute. Um, and I'd like to welcome my associate director, um, Sarah Ross, <laughs> sitting over here. And we have great meetings when it's the three Sarahs together. It's very confusing. Um, so I want to welcome Meinhardt's family who are here. Where are they? Sitting over there somewhere. There they are. Hi. Um, welcome colleagues and friends and collaborators with Meinhard and of course all the students um, who are here this evening as well. Um, Meinhard, this is, as we've said, the second annual legacy lecture in honor of Meinhard. Um, he was a beloved colleague, friend, environmental law scholar, and he left us too soon in September 2022. His contributions to Canadian and international environmental law and policy and to education of the next generation were extensive. His research spanned a wide range of topics, including but not limited to climate change, energy law, invasive species, environmental assessment, decarbonization of shipping, and public participation in environmental decision making. And he published and contributed to many books, including one called From Hot Air to Action, Climate Change Compliance and the Future of International Environmental Law. And I had the pleasure of co-editing with him a book published in 2021 on climate change law and loss and damage. 
He has co-authored Canadian law casebook environmental law cases and materials, has been published in multiple updated editions, and continues to provide a foundation for students of environmental law classes across the country. He taught many courses at the Schulich School of Law in these areas, and he served in many leadership roles, including as Associate Dean Research, Associate Dean Graduate Studies, as the Associate Director of the Marine Environmental Law Institute, and also as its director. And he was involved in many interdisciplinary collaborations, including with the College of Sustainability, um, co-teaching a course on humanity in the natural world. Now, one book of Meinhard's, the one most relevant to this evening's lecture, is called, and here's a copy, a recent one, The Next Generation of Impact Assessment, a Critical Appraisal of the Canadian Impact Assessment Act. And this was co-edited with Meinhard's longtime collaborator, John Sinclair, who is also here somewhere. And I want to also, over there, <laughs> John, and sitting next to John, is another longtime collaborator of Meinhard's in the environmental assessment area, and that's Bob Gibson. And I want to issue a really warm welcome to both of you for traveling to come here to be with us today. This lecture series intends to inspire the next generation of Dalhousie students, whether in law, environmental law, sustainability, um, with the aim of showing how environmental law can contribute solutions to local, national, and global sustainability challenges. And so, in this light, we're particularly delighted to introduce tonight our speaker. Anna Johnston, our legacy lecturer, is a public interest environmental lawyer at West Coast Environmental Law, where her work focuses on environmental impact assessment, cumulative effects, constitutional, biodiversity, and climate law. She's a member of the Minister's Advisory Council on Impact Assessment, co-chairs the Environmental Planning and Assessment Caucus of the Canadian Environmental Network, has authored numerous reports, papers, and book chapters on impact assessment and the constitutional division of powers, which environmental lawyers know are hot, challenging, frustrating topic areas. She's appeared before superior and appellate courts in BC and Alberta, and also the Supreme Court of Canada. And while we note that Anna earned her law degree at the University of Victoria in 2010, she also completed a Master's of Laws here, um, studying under Meinhard Duell's supervision. And her thesis is entitled, Putting the Constitutional Horse Before the Cart, Federal Jurisdiction Over the Next Generation Environmental Assessment. She's represented many communities um, in environmental assessment processes of major energy projects um, and firmly believes that rural northern and indigenous communities should not bear a disproportionate cost of the effects of resource development and throughout her work seeks to establish planning and decision-making processes that will result in sustainable and equitably distributed outcomes for all. And so with that, the appropriate title for this evening's lecture is Fostering Sustainability Takes a Village the collaborative, relational, future-oriented potential of impact assessment. And we warmly welcome Anna for this lecture. Is it on? Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna pull up my... Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that glowing introduction. And thank you to all of the Sarahs for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be here in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq peoples. Many thanks to the Marine and, and Environmental Law Institute and the College of Sustainability for hosting this event. And big thanks to all of you for coming out Anybody who comes to a lecture on impact assessment on a Thursday evening is totally my people. Um, and I'd also like to recognize Wendy Meinhardt's family, his wife Wendy, and his daughters Alita and Nicola, who are here tonight, and also Bob and John um, for coming all the way out here. It's really lovely to have you. And to all of the other colleagues and friends who have come to honor Meinhardt's legacy and keep the momentum of his work going. So this is a talk about impact assessment, but it's also a lecture in Meinhard's name. 
So I'm going to speak about both. I'm going to speak about a vision about how IA can put us on a more sustainable, just, and community-driven path, and also about how Meinhard's thinking and his values inspired that vision. So as Sarah mentioned, Meinhardt was my advisor, my supervisor, when I did my master's here at Dow, but and before that he was a collaborator and a colleague and a mentor, and I was privileged to consider him a friend. I didn't know him nearly as well or for nearly as long as some of the people in the room here tonight did, and certainly not for long enough, but he helped in that short time that I knew him to shape not just my thinking about environmental law, but my ability to think, as well as how I show up in the work that I do. So I first met Meinhardt around 2015 when we had this brand new federal government in that had promised to replace our faulty impact assessment regime with a new, fairer, and more robust one. We were part of this same group the, of assessment participants and experts and practitioners, the Environmental Planning and Assessment Network of the Canadian Envi or Caucus of the Canadian Environmental Network. I had just been a member of the caucus for a couple of years, and my experience at that time with IA was pretty limited to really just to representing clients in two assessments, the Site C Dam in BC and a tar sands project in Alberta. Meinhardt had been a member of the caucus for over 20 years, had co-chaired it on and off, and knew IA inside out. He'd been a panel member on the environmental assessment of the Lower Churchill hydroelectric project, and a member of the technical advisory group that led the strategic environmental assessment of intertidal energy in the Bay of Fundy. He'd written the book on environmental assessment and had just come out with a paper with Bob and John to other IA luminaries proposing a model of next generation environmental assessment for Canada. Um, so to say that I felt out of my depth to be collaborating with Meinhardt and even to be leading a lot of the environmental nonprofit work in this area, uh, it's really an understatement. But what I quickly learned is that this community of experts and practitioners that we're a part of is an, in, an incredibly supportive one that welcomes newcomers and that values an array of voices from scientists to members of grassroots groups that have participated in assessments but have no formal education or expertise in them. And Meinhardt was not the only one with those values, but as a lawyer and an academic, and with his extensive experience, his humility and his drive to support others and to foster community never ceased to amaze and inspire me. And so the themes that I'm going to touch on tonight are both values that I observed in Meinhardt and ways of approaching impact assessment that may restore its promise as a tool for supporting informed environmental decision making and that helps us advance towards a shared vision of a greener and more just future. And I say restore its promise because impact assessment may be at a crisis point once seen as a cornerstone of sound decision making that had the general buy-in of politicians of all stripes, impact assessment has become a deeply partisan issue that some parties have put in their crosshairs, promising to erode it into a 12-month checkbox exercise devoid of meaning or effect, or simply do away with it entirely. In the last decade and a half, the federal government has gone from requiring assessments of thousands of projects and activities that harm the environment to just a dozen or so of the biggest and most destructive projects every year. Assessments have become less focused, less participatory, and more driven towards project approval with perhaps some tweaks to justify their impacts, so long as those tweaks don't come at too high of a cost to proponents. Provincial premiers would, by and large, prefer to accuse the federal government of duplication and jurisdictional overlap than to address those issues through cooperation and coordination. And Indigenous peoples have found that their voices, their laws, and their rights have become so sidelined in Crown assessments that they've begun to conduct their own EAs. 
So a few years ago, Meinhardt and I were lamenting the state of impact assessments in Canada, and after years of advocacy for better processes based on extensive experience of assessments dating back to the 70s, politicians and officials seemed inclined to give up on IA rather than to try to fix the problems with it. I hadn't been doing this work for very long, and already I was feeling disillusioned. If this government that we have now at the federal level, the most environmentally friendly one we've arguably ever had, doesn't believe in impact assessment, what chance did we stand in restoring broader buy-in to it? Characteristically, Meinhardt was a lot less pessimistic than me. He said, okay, so maybe we need to come up with a different model, something they will buy into, something that they will accept. I assumed he had that model up his sleeve and asked him what he was thinking, but he said that's what we needed to figure out. So I've been thinking a lot since that conversation about what an alternative model to impact assessment might look, look like. And where I've landed so far is that I actually don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel. Impact assessment as a concept is sound. Look before you leap. Get informed about environmental decisions before you make them and make sure that your decisions help achieve social, environmental, and economic goals. Respect indigenous rights and knowledge. Let people have a say about decisions that affect them. Prevent problems before they occur rather than get stuck cleaning up the messes after. These are all solid concepts. But I think that Meinhard was right that we need to come up with a better vision of impact assessment, one that can be co-designed with Indigenous peoples so that it respects their rights and decision-making authority, one that trusts the public's knowledge and that the public in turn trusts will protect their well-being and the well-being of their future generations, a model that ensures that the decisions that we make today will safeguard the ecological systems that we depend on for decades and centuries to come. Meinhardt had done a lot of thinking about a better kind of assessment that was participative and credible and based on sustainability imperatives. What I'm going to present tonight are ways to deepen that vision of next generation impact assessment by applying some of those core values that I observed in Meinhardt's work. So the first is that as a starting place, Impact assessment needs to recognize and respect the inherent jurisdiction of the Indigenous peoples in Canada. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recognizes Indigenous peoples' authority, including the right to self-determination and the right to exercise decision-making territory or decision-making authority in their territories. It also commits states to good faith consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples to achieve their free, prior, and informed consent. Canada's constitution recognizes and affirms the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, which the Supreme Court of Canada has confirmed may include the underlying title of their territories. And many argue that the rights of Indigenous peoples protected in Section 35 of the Constitution include the rights that are recognized in the UN Declaration. Since time immemorial, Indigenous laws have been used to govern how Indigenous peoples interact with and sustainably use territories and the resources within them. Indigenous jurisdiction was not extinguished by colonization. It continues to this day. And there's a growing recognition in Canadian Crown law that Indigenous people's ability to exercise their own laws, including their decision-making authority about projects, is an aspect of both international and domestic constitutionally protected Indigenous rights. Despite this reality, Crown, federal and provincial environmental decision-making has largely excluded Indigenous authorities, perpetuating colonizations, marginalization, and alienization of Indigenous peoples from governance and economic prosperity. In addition to the overt denial of Indigenous jurisdiction, Crown assessments tend to operate to prevent Indigenous peoples from deciding whether to grant or withhold consent 
things like mandatory timelines, culturally inappropriate consultation, unbalanced power structures, inadequate notice, lack of sufficient funding, and a bias towards Western science over indigenous knowledge pose often insurmountable obstacles to nation-to-nation -nation dialogue and jurisdictional cooperation. And as a result, indigenous peoples are increasingly exercising their rights and sovereignty by undertaking their own assessments. From the Tsleil-Waututh Nation's assessment of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the Tecumloops to Shequapik Nation's assessment of the Ajax Mine, the Squamish Nation's assessment of the Wood Fiber LNG facility in BC, or the Keboek and Kitigan Zibi and Anishinaabe Nation's assessment of a nuclear waste facility right beside the Ottawa River, Indigenous peoples are designing their own processes that allow them to exercise their decision-making authority according to their own laws and protocols. As the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission found, Crown governments must approach their relationships with Indigenous peoples as nation-to-nation -nation ones and respect Indigenous peoples' rights. What that means for impact assessment is stopping treating indigenous peoples as participants and starting to co-design processes for collaboration on assessments and in decision making. My second proposition is that we need to break free from this notion that impact assessment is only for the biggest projects with the most potential for environmental harms. Our greatest challenges, climate change, the biodiversity crisis, the plastics crisis, the ongoing colonization of indigenous peoples are not single source problems. They're caused by countless decisions that contribute to cumulative effects that push us past tipping points and addressing those challenges can only happen if we mainstream sustainability and decolonization imperatives into every aspect of our governance systems. This notion isn't new to impact assessment. As Mark Winfield writes, EA emerged in the 1960s and 70s out of a growing awareness that the institutionally and legislatively fragmented approach to the management of environmental issues was unable to provide comprehensive perspectives on the potential environmental impacts of proposed projects. Canada's first assessment regime, the Environmental Assessment and Review Process, applied to all initiatives, undertakings, and activities for which the Government Canada of Canada had a decision-making responsibility and that might cause environmental effects. It applied both to physical works as well as policies, plans, programs, and agreements. Similarly, the 1992 Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, our first EA legislation, required assessments of thousands of projects and activities every year that needed a federal approval, occurred on federal lands, received federal funding, or had a federal proponent. The need for comprehensive environmental impact assessment regimes is recognized internationally as well. The Convention on Biological Diversity commits state parties to having environmental impact assessments of not just projects, but of programs and policies that are likely to have significant biodiversity effects. The Global Biodiversity Framework under the CBD, which Canada took a leading role in negotiating a couple of years ago, takes this commitment even further, requiring states to ensure the full integration of biodiversity and its multiple values into policies and regulations, planning and development processes, poverty eradication strategies, strategic environmental assessment, and project level environmental assessment. In May, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea developed, er, delivered a groundbreaking advisory opinion on state parties' climate change obligations under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, finding that state parties have legal obligations to implement measures to protect, prevent, reduce, and control greenhouse gas emissions. These measures include laws for assessing the climate impacts of projects and activities. And yet most projects and activities in Canada do not go through an impact assessment. Some provinces, like Ontario, don't require IA of private sector projects at all. Others focus assessments only on select projects deemed to have significant adverse effects. When in 2012, we scrapped thousands of federal assessments per year, we lost a crucial piece of oversight for projects that cumulatively affect things within federal jurisdiction, like fish, like threatened and endangered species, migratory birds, and the health and navigability of our lakes and rivers. 
Why? When I was engaging in the federal EA review process in, from 2016 to 2019 and talking with officials over and over about the need to restore assessments for all environmentally risky undertakings, the most common counter argument I was given was that EA either didn't add value to environmental decision making or its value wasn't commensurate with the amount of time and resources that it took. It had become formulaic, bloated and polarizing the minor screenings of smaller projects like wharves and culverts had become little more than checkbox exercises, and comprehensive assessments had ballooned into tens of thousands of pages of information that hardly anyone had the time or resources or expertise to read. Politicians wanted to be able to say that they were helping get shovels in the ground, and officials didn't want to be burdened with the responsibility for processes dealing with effects that they considered trivial. But the effects of those smaller projects aren't trivial, and what some call small projects are in fact not small at all. Sockeye salmon are at a crisis point in BC because of death by a thousand cuts. Caribou across Canada's boreal forests and from the Arctic tundra to our southern mountain ranges are endangered or threatened because of habitat loss caused by things like forestry and oil and gas operations that fly under the impact assessment radar. Our biodiversity is in a free fall between 1970 and 2014. Mammal populations in Canada dropped 43%. Amphibian and reptile populations dropped 34%. And fish populations dropped 20%. Species assessed at risk in Canada at that same period saw their populations decline by 49%, 59%, sorry. Habitat loss due to myopic and disjointed decisions that consider cumulative effects inadequately or not at all is a major driver of that decline. And instead of looking for solutions, instead of rediscovering the spirit of IA and seeking ways to bring meaning to it, instead of coming up with a design that would allow it to be tailored to different circumstances and proportional within the scale of potential effects, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. And we did so at arguably the worst time in human history to give up such an important environmental tool. The twin biodiversity and climate crises demand urgent action. That action in turn demands transparency, it demands careful planning, and it demands deliberative and inclusive dialogue. Impact assessment exists because narrowly focused and unparticipatory regulatory approval processes, things like Fisheries Act authorizations, Navigable Waters Act permits, explosive permits that allow proponents to blast the tops off mountains, are designed to approve projects with standard mitigation measures for a set of impacts that are limited to one narrow focus area, like impacts on fish or water quality, rather than the whole suite of a project's interrelated and intersecting impacts and their broader socioeconomic repercussions. They, those regulatory approval processes don't transparently evaluate whether a project should be allowed to take up public resources or wreak havoc on the environment, or whether or how to distribute equitably the, distrib the benefits that would come from allowing that destruction to occur. Jocelyn Stacy argues that the widespread rollback of federal environmental law was an attempt to exempt environmental decision makers from the basic requirements of a democratic conception of the rule of law. According to Stacy, to remain committed to the rule of law, democratic governments must publicly justify decisions that affect people and the environment on the basis of core constitutional principles like fairness and reasonableness. As the only environmental decision-making tool we have that has broad participation and decisions that must be made public, impact assessment is a critical way for the public to be able to hold governments to account and ensure that decisions are helping to advance reconciliation and meet our climate and biodiversity targets. Meinhard, along with John Sinclair and Peter Dunker, Professor Emeritus of Dallas School for Resource and Environmental Studies, proposed reconceiving cumulative effects as a mindset. 
A core assumption of this mindset is that every interaction between a human activity and a component of the environment will have a cumulative effect unless it can be convincingly demonstrated otherwise. We know that the most important effects are cumulative effects, and we also know that most human activities will at some point result in or contribute to cumulative effects. So let's center cumulative effects in our evaluations and decisions rather than tacking them on as an afterthought. So I'd like to offer a similar proposition that we need to adopt an impact assessment mindset, one that assumes that impact assessment should be required before an environmental decision can be made unless it can be convincingly de demonstrated that an assessment isn't necessary. We know that IA is our best tool for ensuring that project level decisions align with our reconciliation and sustainability imperatives. We also know that where IA has not delivered in the past on its promises, those issues were with implementation, not the fundamental concept. So let's center impact assessment in all decisions about projects, activities, plans, programs, policies, spending decisions. Let's treat it as the rule rather than the exception. My third proposition is that impact assessment needs to be focused on the future. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't also consider the past. Cumulative effects assessment needs to include a thorough understanding of the impacts of past and existing activities and how those activities have altered species and systems, but it can't stop there. To be effective, IA has to be oriented towards a desired vision of the future. So project assessment is like a compass. You, ha you use it to help you get to where you want to go, which means that as a starting place, you need to figure out where you want to be in 10, 20, 100 years from now. Otherwise, it's directionless. If there's no clear understanding of the desired states of the environment and socioeconomic conditions, then an impact assessment can't be used to evaluate the extent to which any particular project will help or hinder your ability to get to those desired states. For as long as we've been doing impact assessment, we've known that it has to be applied at the regional and strategic levels as well as to project decisions. We've also known for decades that responsible decision making can really only occur when in the presence of regional and strategic assessments and land use planning and then has to also be tied in to regulatory permitting. As Meinhard conceived them, Regional and strategic assessments are the tools for setting the strategic direction for a region, a watershed, a class of project, or a policy direction, and project level assessment is the tool for implementing that vision. But as long as there's been recognition of that need for higher level assessment and planning, there has been excuses for avoiding them. So as a result, project level assessment is almost always done without a map to guide where we want it to take us. And so to break the cycle, we need to create off-ramps. Reinhardt wrote about the need for off-ramps back in 2006 and more recently recommended it to the Senate Standing Committee on Environment and Natural Resources when it was reviewing Bill C-69, the Impact Assessment Act. What he recognized was that when people show up to participation opportunities, when they take the time to write submissions or come to a hearing, they want and they deserve to be able to talk about the issues of concern to them. Impact assessments offer a rare opportunity for people to talk about their concerns, their environmental concerns, their socioeconomic concerns in a way that feels concrete. A mine might create jobs, but who gets those jobs and how long they might last often trigger a broader conversation about fairness or fears of another boom and bust cycle. A new dam isn't responsible for the effects of all the other activities that came before and harmed the river, but its assessment might trigger conversations about who's responsible for cleaning up the watershed and paying for those past harms. Those questions might be outside the scope of any given project assessment, but instead of sweeping them under the rug, an off-ramp would help ensure that an, that an appropriate venue for those conversations is created. Aaron Bruce, a Squamish First Nation lawyer and architect of the Squamish Nation's assessment of the wood fiber LNG project, similarly argues that all assessment processes should include off-ramps for dealing with issues related to Indigenous rights, legacy issues, Indigenous authority that need to be addressed in order for Indigenous peoples to be able to decide whether to give their free, prior, and informed consent to any given project. So in other words, impact assessments that include off-ramps 
would en enable that process for when a project assessment is triggered in the absence of a strategic direction set by a higher tier assessments like regional and strategic assessments, as well as for when valid issues are raised in project assessments that lack an appropriate venue for dealing with them. Not only would the off-ramp be a means of triggering those planning processes or broader conversations, it would also put project level assessment on hold until decision makers have the direction that they need to assess whether and to what extent the project aligns or misaligns with our shared vision of the future. When in the 1970s, Justice Berger held his inquiry into a proposed natural gas pipeline that would run through the Yukon and the Mackenzie River Valley of the Northwest Territories, he recognized that assessment wasn't, the assessment wasn't just about a natural gas pipeline, it related to the whole future of the North. A lot of projects trigger conversations about their broader ramifications and the future of regions. Today, we have dams flooding river valleys in the name of cheap electricity, that, but that might actually go to electrify liquefied natural gas instead of people's homes. We have roads that would open Ontario's far north to development that could significantly disrupt one of the world's biggest carbon stores. We have mines claiming to be critical with zero inquiry into those claims. We have transmission lines proposing to service those mines with no consideration about what other industrial activities might be drawn to the new source of power. And as I mentioned above earlier, we have thousands of smaller but still cumulatively impactful activities being approved every year with little or no thought to whether they help us get to where we want to be. We can't keep letting officials kick the regional and strategic can down the road so that they can keep getting away with politically convenient decisions that favor the short-term economic interests of a few over the long-term environmental, social, and economic needs of everyone. An off-ramp ramp would incentivize, if not force, officials to undertake regional and strategic assessments so that they have to evaluate whether and how a project will help us get to where we want to go, even where the political will is lacking. Which leads me to my fourth point. I'm increasingly convinced that we need to divorce environmental decision-making and therefore impact assessment from politics. Canada is no stranger to independent tribunals making regulatory decisions and adjudicating disputes. The CRTC regulates and supervises broadcasting and telecommunications. The Canadian Energy Regulator approves and regulates pipelines and transmission lines. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission regulates nuclear projects. But most environmental decisions in Canada are made by elected representatives and are highly discretionary in nature. We know from 50 years of environmental decision making that these decisions overwhelmingly favor the economy over environmental protection or indigenous rights, even when the economic benefits are spurious or will only accrue to a few. From large scale dams like Lower Churchill or Site C to tar sands projects that you can see from space, elected officials are failing to protect the environment to a degree that cannot be sustained. As Meinhard wrote in a 2019 blog on the future of environmental law, we are fundamentally mismanaging our relationship to nature and this depletion of natural resources and the destruction of natural systems is the result of poor choices. Let's try a new model, one that takes environmental decisions out of the realm of politics and into the hands of authorities that have clear mandates to protect Canadians' health, respect Indigenous rights, and ensure that decisions align with sustainability objectives. We wouldn't be the first. New Zealand's Environmental Protection Authority is an independent agency that reports to the Environment Minister, but that's responsible for regulating things like hazardous substances, emissions, and marine activities. In 2022, it launched a 330 and 300-year strategy to guide its work and measure its pro progress. And Australia has proposed a similar entity to be responsible for regulatory and implementation functions of its main environmental law. Unlike elected representatives to whom the courts tend to give broad deference, unelected tribunals can be more easily held to account if they don't follow policy direction or are numerous climate, biodiversity, and environmental obligations and commitments. 
I'm not suggesting that there should be no rule for elected representatives in environmental regulation. In a democracy, it's proper for cabinet to establish the regulatory framework that governs environmental decision making. What I am proposing is that we might have a better chance of actually achieving our legislative and policy objectives and following a sustainable path if the day-to-day -day decisions were made by an independent and unelected authority mandated to achieve those goals. I'm also, for the record, not suggesting that an independent authority would be without risk. The former National Energy Board was widely criticized as being a captured regulator, and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission faces similar accusations of favoring industry over public safety. But we know that the current model isn't working, and being aware of the pitfalls helps us avoid them. An independent tribunal could also be co-established with Indigenous peoples as a means of upholding and respecting Indigenous jurisdiction and advancing reconciliation through shared decision-making. There are numerous models, north and south of 60 in Canada, to learn from. So let's try. Fifth, impact assessment has to be a team sport. Identifying and implementing that shared vision of a desired future that I keep talking about has to be a collective exercise that is inclusive of all the voices who stand to be affected. Meinhard was a community builder. He deeply valued and supported collective action and approached his work as a lawyer and an academic with humility. I mentioned in the introduction that our little environmental planning and assessment caucus has a wide variety of members ranging from academics to scientists to grassroots participants. It's not always easy for people with vastly different backgrounds and experience to understand each other, but Meinhard had this incredible ability to really hear what people were trying to say, whether they were a scientist, another lawyer, or a member of a scrappy little grassroots group with no formal education in impact assessment, but a deep commitment to their local environment. A few years ago, we were drafting a two-day agenda for a caucus meeting. Our main objective was hammering out our consensus recommendations for the, what should be in the new Impact Assessment Act, and our agenda was totally packed. I suggested cutting this long-standing agenda item that we call the Hot Spots Go Round, where everybody takes turns talking about the issues that they're dealing with in their communities or in their work. I wanted to get to the really juicy law reform stuff that I like geeking out on and thought that we could skip the part where everybody sits around and gripes about how proponents and governments are mucking it all up. Meinhard was said no. He said that the hot spots go round was one of the most important parts of our meetings because it lets everybody give voice to the things that are important to them and it helps us understand each other and our work better. And he was right. I've since realized that those roundtable conversations where people get to air the issues that are top of mind for them and that help each other explore solutions are an incredibly valuable way of building community and harnessing the power of collective thinking. They're also the way for those of us that are working in offices in cities to actually know what's happening on the ground. An impact assessment is the same. If we're not meaningfully including the voices of local community members, of youth, of different populations, how can we expect to understand local priorities and risks? You don't need to be a scientist to know where the certain species are. Hunters, trappers, and fishers who are out on the land often have a deeper knowledge of the local environment than consultants can ever hope to have. Similarly, if we don't engage independent scientists and government experts meaningfully, if we predominantly rely on whatever information the proponents are giving us, we know that we'll have a less comprehensive and less credible basis of information on which to make our decisions. Instead of treating participation and engagement as a checkbox exercise, impact assessment needs to embody the understanding that everybody has something to contribute and that meaningful engagement takes deliberative dialogue based on mutual respect and learning. To implement that mindset, we have to let go of the old model where the assessment authority operates behind closed doors, asking for occasional submissions and then summarizing its information in a report. We need to turn impact assessment into a collective exercise, one in which 
concentric and overlapping circles of working groups collaborate on things like identifying the issues of concern, what priorities to focus on, what studies need to be conducted, who's going to review those studies and make sure that they're accurate. The working group model is not far from new. I'm not pretending to have invented it. Meinhardt and others have been advocating for it for decades. And it's been used sporadically here and there in Canada, but the general rule has always been that the assessment authority runs the show and participation is a step in the process rather than the process itself. We need to make it the process. So in my envisioning of it, there'd be a working group of independent experts, a working group of community members and environmental groups, a working group of youth, a working group of health specialists and social scientists, all of them not only meeting together, but meeting across their working groups and with the proponent and with the decision-making authorities to ensure a truly cooperative and collaborative approach. And those various working groups would receive financial and other resource aids that they need in order to be effective and ensure mutual learning. And they wouldn't end when a decision is made. They should carry on into implementation, into follow-up and monitoring to ensure not just rigorous oversight, but also make sure that we're learning from experience. The Tacomops to Chequetmic Nations assessment of the Ajax mine in BC applied this model or a similar model. The foundation of the assessment was a panel comprised of family representatives of all 13 families in the nation. It involved youth and elders and resulted in the creation of an intern program to continue to build capacity and teach students what they call walking on two legs, which is a way of bringing both science and indigenous knowledge into environmental governance. Meinhard knew that advancing sustainability requires supporting and empowering community leaders, students, and each other. In that same 2019 blog on the future of environmental law, he said that in order to be able to address the environmental challenges ahead, we need to give students the tools for critical analysis so that they can diagnose problems in light of ever-changing circumstances and find their own solutions. Impact assessment is both a means and a beneficiary of building and sharing knowledge and analytical skills. Its participation opportunities are a way for us to equip each other, including younger generations, with information and skills for preventing harms, for enhancing benefits, and it's also much more effective when it's informed by diverse, diverse knowledge and thinking. And finally, we must we must, sorry, there's a mouse. Um, <laughs> mice like impact assessment. Uh, we must constantly be seeking out and focusing on what's possible. We're facing what can easily feel like insurmountable challenges. The climate crisis is well upon us as we're all witnessing. I'm going to skip the list of ways we're witnessing it. Species, as I mentioned, are dying, declining at an unprecedented rate and have, we've barely begun to turn our attention to the plastics that are choking our waters and invading our bodies. At the same time, environmental protection has become a deeply partisan issue with parties and industries around the world continuing to deny the reality of climate change and the need to abandon the lunacy of an economic model that is premised on the delusion of infinite growth. It's easy to feel daunted but perhaps the thing that I admired most about Meinhard was his seemingly tireless ability to break complex problems down into manageable parts, to untangle issues in order to make them approachable, and then to find straightforward and simple solutions for them. He didn't pretend to have all the answers, but he did stress the need to try. One time we were talking about barriers to regional assessment that we kept hearing from officials, pushback from uncooperative provinces worried about jurisdictional overreach, too much time and money to build out assessments to a regional scale. I was struggling to come up with compelling arguments for why the feds should just do it anyways. Meinhardt's response, simplify it. He said the question of manageability is simply a matter of scoping. You don't have to do all or nothing. If there's a risk that a province would challenge an assessment on jurisdictional grounds, scope it just to look at federal effects. 
if even just looking at all the federal effects, it still seems unmanageable and bloated, begin with priority effects. You can always expand the scope down the road. It's better to begin with a more focused regional assessment than not to do one at all. In other words, find the possible. Yes, impact assessment involves complexity. Environmental components don't exist in silos. They exist in systems with interactions among other environmental effects and with human systems interactions that we've really only begun to understand. Benefits like jobs are rarely uniformly distributed among populations and often perpetuate rather than dismantle inequities. And as we saw in a recent Supreme Court of Canada decision on the Impact Assessment Act, reference Canada's form of federalism and the jurisdictional bun fighting that often occurs between the provinces and the feds makes addressing these challenges even more difficult. But those complexities don't mean that doing impact assessment well is impossible. Next Generation IA is possible. We have examples of credible, participatory, sustainability-focused assessments to remind us that good is doable, and the components of Next Generation IA, the model that Meinhardt advocated for, are also doable. We may not get them right all at once, but that doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't pursue them. Sustainability is possible. A climate-safe future is possible. Nature positive is possible. Justice and equity are possible. An impact assessment can help us towards those goals. It may be that the, way, the ways to deepen Meinhardt's vision of next generation impact assessment are not politically or socially feasible as a package yet. yet. We have a federal election coming up within the next year, and the leader who is leading by a mile in the polls has promised to eviscerate federal EA, while well, the government that promised to restore it to its former glory is now looking for ways to streamline their own regime. But some things for sure will be possible. Students and young people can call on political parties to commit to strong environmental and climate protection, including impact assessment. Participants in impact assessments can form their own working groups as a means of sharing knowledge and information rather than waiting for a recalcitrant agency. Indigenous nations and civil society organizations can partner on impact assessments that serve as next generation models of success. And at the same time, we have to be continually thinking about new ways to do impact assessment better. The next, next generation of impact assessment, as Sarah Sek has coined it. We have decades of experience behind us, but we also have tremendous environmental and social challenges ahead of us. We know that when dedicated people pool their knowledge and skills in collaboration towards a shared goal, that they can be infinitely more effective than when working alone. What I learned from Meinhard and others in our merry little EA caucus is that impact assessment is as much about relationships as it is about science and law. So when we're thinking about the future of impact assessment, both how to design a better model and how to implement it, we need to stay focused on the possible, optimistic about its potential, and rooted in relationships and dialogue in its application. And we need students like you all here tonight and the ones that will come after you to join us in this work to get involved in the ongoing evolution of IA so not only can it do a better job of addressing today's environmental issues, but it'll be equipped to deal with tomorrow's challenges as well. We need to learn from each other and challenge each other to think more, think deeply, and think flexibly. When we lost Meinhardt, we didn't just lose a tremendous human. The world and those working to protect it lost a powerhouse contributor to our ability to generate solutions to the biggest environmental challenges of our time. Now more than ever, we need to stop working in silos and come together to generate ideas, to share our learning and experience, to imagine pathways towards a sustainable future, and to remind each other that solutions are possible. And so for the future of impact assessment, let's remember its successes, learn from its failures, and work together towards continuous improvement. 
the ways to deepen the model that I've proposed here tonight may not work. They may work, they may not. I offer them not so much as fully baked solutions as a way to spark ideas and in the hopes of broadening the tent of people that are thinking about these issues and ways to solve them. One of the greatest pleasures of my career have been my collaborations on impact assessment and I hope that some of you here tonight will find similar strength and inspiration and often solace in collaborating on solutions to the threats to our planet and society. We need your energy, we need your thinking, and we need your optimism. And so tonight I'm going to leave you with a challenge. Although I'm not going to leave, I'm going to stick around for questions. But I am going to leave you with a challenge, which is to think of your own ways that impact assessment can be the tool that we need it to be, with the buy-in that we need it to have, to put us on a more sustainable and just path. You may come up with similar ideas that, as me, and you may come up with entirely new ones, but I am confident that what you come up with will be a positive contribution to the conversation. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, off-ramps quite a few times, and I think I was a little confused as to what specifically an off-ramp off was and like how that opened up uh, conversations. Yeah, okay. Sorry if that wasn't clear. So really what I'm talking about when I talk about an off-ramp is if you're in a project-level assessment, right? Let's say that someone wants to dam a local river and you go into the assessment and you say, but wait a minute, we actually don't know kind of what the broader vision of like all the electricity needs of the region are going to be and all the different ways that those electricity needs could be met, instead of continuing on with the assessment and this kind of narrow focus like, do we need the power, do we not need the power, let's put it on hold. The off-ramp is really just like another way of saying, we'll put the project assessment on hold and require us to open up that broader conversation about the like strategic initiatives and the regional needs that we have to answer the broader questions that we need to solve. Other questions? I'm, I'm back here. I'm often funnier in my answers than I am in my notes, so. <laughs> questions will make this livelier. Um, thanks, Anna. That was great. Um, I, uh, I have a question about, it's not a theoretical question for once. It's a practical question. Um, this working group idea, this working group model, which sounds great and it has some precedence, would, would these folks all do it for free? <laughs> I hope not. No, I don't think it's feasible for them to do it for free because, you know, especially, it would be a lot of work, right? Because I don't think anybody sees the value in a 10 year long assessment of a mine. So I think it would be something close to a you know, a part-time job at least, so it would have to be compensated. So would the model be the same that the proponents pay for it? Cost recovery, so not paying, I don't like the idea of proponents paying directly. Um, you mean via consultants that Well, they more that yeah. they would, so right now the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada is coming up with its cost recovery regulation, so that could be a way of having the proponent be the one that pays, but it, the money would flow through the agency rather than directly from the proponent, just to keep that bit of distance so there's not a perception of um, influence. Because the reason I asked that question was not to be boring, but, but uh, that the, um, you, you're not just talking about a distribution, a different kind of creative distribution of energy and talent and expertise. You're also talking about a return to a, vastly greater number of yeah. these things. And the, the argument that is yeah. put, has been put to me by people on the inside, I won't mention names, said that we can't afford it. We can't afford to do, to return to the old ways, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, um, I mean, you, I'm not asking you to say, can we afford it? Because that's, you know, that's probably not a question you wanna answer, but, but I think that's, that's the challenge. That's why I asked the practical question. I, I just wonder whether or not part of the vision might be that there has to be uh, an engagement of interest across sectors. Um, I, I think academia has to be engaged in ways that could be done pro bono because it can be a research interest as opposed to like a 
public service work. But anyway, that's why I was asking that question. Yeah, Thanks. so I think, I think that's it, right? Like I think, you know, channeling my inner Meinhardt, I would say, like with the, region, the answers to the issues around regional assessment, it doesn't mean that you need to have 20 people in every working group. It could be that you begin with a model where you have one or two youth reps, one or two community leaders, a biologist, a soil scientist, right? Like, you probably can start smaller and look for partnerships where your independent experts have independent funding to help foot the bill. But right now, it is so, we're so far away from that model. So we can take baby steps towards it. We're just, we're not even shuffling. I think we have a question. This is a question from Kyle Vermet. Anna, I want to start by acknowledging the network of support you mentioned. I was welcomed and supported by John, Bob, yourself, and of course, Meinhardt. Meinhardt always made time to share his expertise with me, and I am deeply grateful for this. Meinhardt taught me that optimism is necessary to undertake novel work. I wanted to share my sincere gratitude and respect for Meinhardt with his family. Can you talk a little bit more about biodiversity and impact assessment and whether the term environment includes biodiversity in its definition in the Impact Assessment Act and whether the proposed Federal Nature Accountability Act missed an opportunity in failing to address impact assessment? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, to, so I mean, the first... Answer to the first question, yes, I do think that the definition of environment in the Impact Assessment Act includes biodiversity. Um, and as you know, Kyle, it, the Act also requires assessments to consider the extent to which a project helps or hinders Canada's ability to meet its environmental obligations, and its environmental obligations include its, in, its biodiversity obligations under the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so, yes, I think that if, for example, if a federal assessment failed to consider biodiversity, I think that there's a good chance that somebody could sue the agency for failing to consider that. Like, I think it, it, there's a pretty good argument that it's a legal requirement. For the Nature Accountability Act, so I don't know if people are, um, have been following, but the federal government tabled a bill, Bill C-73, in June called, that will be called if it's passed, a Nature Accountability Act. Um, it's a good question about whether it failed in not mentioning impact assessment. I, like, I worked pretty closely on the Climate Accountability Act, the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, and the way that we conceive accountability, it's very hard to hold governments to account, legally to hold them to account for meeting targets, especially for biodiversity. I just think there's so much, it's so diffuse and there are so many policy decisions that a court would be quite reluctant to hold a government legally to account for meeting its biodiversity obligations. And so when I have been thinking about accountability, I'm thinking more about public accountability, and that's how that act, the bill is quite weak, but the way that um, it was envisioned is that it would bring accountability through transparency in setting targets, in coming up with plans, in coming up with reports. And so it doesn't, it doesn't actually mention anything substantive in it. Um, Maybe the short answer to your question is, yes, I think it probably could be strengthened if it mentioned impact assessment, and in particular if it mentioned this tool called the mitigation hierarchy that requires first that you avoid biodiversity harms, and then you minimize them, and then you restore them. But, you know, I think, I think the act has potential to merge with impact assessment, and yeah. I think, yeah, I think I'm optimistic that we can maybe not explicitly but implicitly bring impact assessment into some of the requirements that we aim to get under the Nature Accountability Act. How do you propose, um, how do you propose we determine whether or not a project is large enough to warrant an impact assessment? For instance, if someone wants to build a single family home with that require an impact assessment too? Did Justice Rowe of the Supreme Court of Canada tell you to ask that question? 
I say that because in the Supreme Court of Canada reference, he asked a similar question about the Act used to say that assessments had to consider every um, transboundary air pollution effects, and he was like, well, does that mean my home furnace is going to be subject? So you and a Supreme Court of Canada justice are on the same page. Um, the way that the, the triggering was done in the good old days was that all decisions that required a federal authorization, so like a, like a permit for harming fish habitat, would then go through a screening level assessment. And so a house is just so unlikely, like maybe if you're building a McMansion right on top of a river, yeah, and maybe we do want you to like maybe we do actually want to take a look at whether that merits approval or not. But a regular house, no. I think the, the way that the triggering model that the next generation model suggests using is that the proposal has to have potential for like non-trivial environmental harm. And then the other thing that's important is that we talk about like designing assessments so that the scale of the assessment is commensurate with the scale of the impact. So smaller projects like culverts and wharves, I'm not talking about them going through a three-year process. They should just be getting some kind of oversight. Um, thank you so much for your talk. So you were talking a lot about um, kind of the damage that has already been done uh, over the last several years with kind of a lack of an effective kind of impact assessment structure. So I was wondering if you, could see there being any role for kind of retrospective impact assessment, like looking at projects that have gone ahead um, and kind of reevaluating them with kind of a new and improved impact assessment model to start kind of undoing some of those damages? Totally, and that's, that's one of the key things that when we talk about regional assessment, that's what regional assessments can do, right? Because it's not, it's not about whether this certain project should occur, so we could do a regional assessment of sort of the, like a watershed, take a look at the damage that's already been done, think about the proponents that want to come in and take more resources and do more damage and then find ways, so have we passed tipping points, is this it for the region, how do we deal with those legacy effects, if we're not quite past the tipping point, is there more that we can ask of new proponents? to, like, it's, it's easier in biodiversity than it is with climate, but to, you know, offset for any areas that they have damaged before. So yeah, that's why stepping back and taking that bigger picture approach at the outset is really important because it helps us not just to look at the future, but it also helps us make sure that we're addressing those issues that have come up in the past. I just wanted to take Anna up on the promise she made that she can be a lot funnier when she's not talking in a formal lecture. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I know that Anna has gone through countless cases, uh, and some of them have had comedy involved, and at very least, some of them have been positive. I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell your favorite positive story. Oh, well, that's convenient because we have a... Um a panel member from one of my favorite positive stories here in the audience tonight. Leslie Griffiths is here. And one of the, yeah, and there have definitely been positive models. And so um, the, the Boise's Bay nickel mine is an early example of, before my time, of an assessment that was incredibly effective. And Leslie and I were just talking about this over lunch today. That, so one of the issues that came up for that community was they weren't necessarily opposed to the mine, but there was this big concern that the proponent had suggested a fairly aggressive pace and scale of mining activity. So the mine was only gonna last how long? Like 12, 15 years. Like it was gonna be a really short duration. And the community was worried about boom and bust. And through the assessment process, the, all of the, and it was also a highly collaborative assessment with two indigenous nations, the provincial and federal governments, really participatory, and talking with community members, talking with those four governments, they were, and talking with the proponent, they were able to come up with a, a lower schedule of mining that would occur over a much longer period so that it has resulted in much more sustainable economic benefits for the community. So that's the kind of thing that you're not going to get in a permitting process in like a, an or export permit or a Fisheries Act authorization. That's exactly the kind of thing that impact assessment is designed to do, is to generate those conversations and to find solutions that work for everybody. 
other questions? Thank you, Bob. <laughs> but even my answer wasn't funny. <laughs> um, you had mentioned a bit about the, um, like, uh, sorry, let me look at my notes, independent and un, uh, elected groups of people who would potentially be invoked to make these environmental decisions. I was just wondering who or um, how these groups of people would be in place, uh, yeah. if that would be through, like, obviously not elected, but what sort of procedure? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think that that really is one of the critical things that can make or break those bodies, is who appoints them and who they are. I, so the New Zealand model that I mentioned, there's another body that's another independent body that then appoints the tribunal members. So you can do that. Um, you know, some models would have ministerial appointments. That's how our Canadian Energy Regulator and Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission go. The problem with that is that you get people who really accord with the political, like you don't get that distance from politics. And so I think to ensure that you have good people, the right people in the job, I think you need two things. I think you need like really clear terms of reference and criteria for membership. Um, maybe three things actually. And then you need some sort of a recommendation process that is also independent of government. And then the other I mentioned, which is co-appointment with indigenous peoples, right? Once you start to get like multi-jurisdictional appointments then, or at least recommendations onto this body, then you, know, you have less of an ability for one particular party of the day to try to influence the tribunal to do what they want. But yeah, it's incredibly important, and it has gone both ways in Canada because of who is on the, the body. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, Anna. And I'll, I'm just going to hand you over to, over, over to the other Sarah, or another Sarah. <laughs> um, Anna, I want to just extend our warmest thanks for what was a fabulous lecture and um, rich discussion also. Uh, we're really grateful to you for coming out for this talk. And um, My pleasure. yeah, thank you. And I also want to just extend some thanks to uh, Deborah and College of Sustainability for um, co organizing this with us at the Marine Environmental Law Institute and also thank my colleague Lori um, for all of her assistance in this. So thank you everybody and um, thanks Dana and have a wonderful thank evening. You.